Right. Thank you. Morning, everyone. My name is Els, and this is my colleague, Matt. Hello. We're both from the University of Birmingham, so we haven't had very far to come today. Um, so thank you for coming to this particular session, which is a workshop about accessible and inclusive practice. So what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about things that we've done and we'll have an element of reflection and then we'll also see perhaps what you would like to do yourselves if there are ways that you could do similar things to what we've done. So what we've done uh, is called the Inclusive Educator Initiative. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is, show you some of the content, and then we'll talk about the impact that it's had at our university and what it's led to. And that's what the accessible educator refers to. So as I said, we'll give you some examples and ask the question, what you could be doing next. So first of all, the aims and content of what we were trying to do. So what we wanted to do was have a means for educators to commit to inclusive practice. So it's different from Let's have a training course on inclusion. We've got that. It's compulsory. And when people start the university, they have to do it. And it's very general. But we work uh, with academics and other staff at the university. And we felt it was important to talk about inclusion, specifically in the roles that people had, without making them jump through a hoop and tick a box and say, yeah, I've done that. I'm inclusive now. It was about a commitment towards becoming more inclusive. And so what we did is we created a voluntary resource. Sometimes we call it a course, but it's not like here's a course, you have to take this course so you can sign up for this course. It functions in many different ways. It's a repository and it's a tool for communication. I'll, we'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And so we wanted to use an existing platform, so nothing new and something that was accessible uh, at any time. But crucially, when we were talking to our uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of Education at the time, she was very keen that it needed to be done in 30 minutes or less. Um, and of course, the reason for that is, is if you package it as something that can be done in 30 minutes or less, the very busy academics all around us might be more likely to engage with it and think, oh, I've got 30 minutes. Obviously, the, the aim is that they would come back to it, that there would be some level of continued engagement with it. But it was very much, and I think that is part of its success, uh, packaged as something that you can do this in 30 minutes. You know, do you want to know a little bit more about it? Do you want to commit to this? Are you inclusive already? Or is there more that you want to learn? That's what you can do. So we also, you can see there, had uh, a badge designed so again people could put that uh, on their profiles online in their signatures and what have you so there was also a little sort of outward thing that people could show again to encourage perhaps other people to wonder about what it was and engage with it and so the design principles of this was that it needed to be realistic concise focused practical and I thought it was also very important that it would be enjoyable to some extent, not some terrible thing that you felt, oh, I don't want to work through this. Uh, also, we wanted to make sure that everything in there was evidence-based to give it credibility so that we're, we're not going to say, oh, this is inclusive practice, when actually we don't have the evidence to back that up. Um, and I already said we didn't want people to have to do this and tick it off, uh, but it would be part of an ongoing process as something that you could go back to as a commitment that you make rather than something that you tick off as oh I'm inclusive now um, and it needed to be comprehensive and address inclusion and enhanced representation of all underrepresented groups that's a big ask so obviously certainly in 30 minutes but it actually helped to have something very wide as the focus so that you could link to lots of resources and think about the types of groups that needed to be thought about and included, but not sort of uh, throw lots of information at people because they weren't going to take all that in at that point, but that if they had a question, they could come to it. 
and find some answers about the particular students, for example, that they uh, were thinking about. And then very importantly, the four things at the bottom, we wanted it to encourage self-evaluation, generate as a bank of good practice, but also promote continued discussion, ownership of the resource, and establish a community and promote collaboration. So as I said, we used an existing platform. So we simply used the VLE, which everybody was already familiar with and was very easy for us to put things onto. So we kept it very, very simple in that sense. Um, so I'll talk very briefly now about the impact that it's had on accessible and inclusive practice. Not that you can measure that very easily. I'm not suggesting that for a moment, but what we did see is that people um, did enroll themselves. So there's a self-enroll link. It was sent around, uh, it was university-wide communication and also in specific targeted groups. We did go and talk to departments about it and people did enroll themselves on it. And then we got some people who are EDI champions in their departments who were telling other people about it. And we started getting inquiries about, could we make this compulsory? It's like, we don't want to, that's part of, of the whole ethos, but we did embedded in our courses that were already uh, existing, the training for postgraduates who teach uh, and the PGC in higher education. Uh, again, it wasn't compulsory in the sense that they had to do that in order to pass their courses, but it was part of the courses and we led them to it so that everybody who starts at the university knows that it exists and can come back to it. As opposed to if you ask people, did you do EDI training right when they started at induction, they've forgotten because they just did it alongside lots of other things they had to do, and it was very overwhelming. Um, and so the only challenges, and this is this is something that we do keep thinking about, are to keep spreading the word. I mean, can you put that information out again about this thing existing? Are people that are on that are enrolled? Are they telling other people about it? Um, and obviously, we want people to in, to come back and ensure that the resources are um, up to date. Is another thing that we need to make sure somebody's doing that. And if something new comes out, say from Advanced HE about inclusion, we make sure that it's posted and then added to the bank of resources so that people always have the latest uh, information about whatever area of inclusion there is. So it takes a little bit of time to maintain, but not that much. And it is because it's a VLE, it has got this discussion platforms built in, it's got quizzes built in. So the interaction um, does come with it. Um, already. So that's been really, really useful. <laughs> Welcome. Um, yeah. Yeah. And another example of the impact is that people, we, we could see on the discussion boards that people started talking about particular themes that were of interest to them. And one major theme that came out was accessibility as part of the whole talk about inclusion. A lot of people were talking about how do I make my materials more uh, accessible, which was part of the course, but that's where the discussions very often went when people were talking about their practice or what they wanted to develop. So we saw that and we thought, hmm, okay, I think there's perhaps a need for accessible educator. I think that's how it went. That's Matt. pretty much it, isn't it, I think. Yeah, so as Elle said, there's a, there's a lot of resources in, in the inclusive educator and conversations around accessibility, um, but more and more of the discussion topics within the reflective discussion were around accessibility and digital accessibility and considerations and questions and, and, and observations around that. Um, and we've already got an extensive set of digital accessibility resources for staff um, in terms of technical guidance, in terms of how to you know, comply with the legislation, those kind of things. Um, but we wanted something that was more practice driven and was more about approaches that you might take from a teaching practice perspective. Um, and that's where the, the accessible educator came along. So exactly the same model as the inclusive educator, the same kind of approach. It's a 30 minute self-paced course. It is primarily reflective. It's about you thinking about your approach to your teaching um, rather than just kind of testing your knowledge and being bombarded with all the legislation and all the requirements around the web content accessibility guidelines and, and all that kind of stuff. That information is there and it's signposted if they want to find it. It's, we signpost backwards and forwards between our more technical guidance resources as well. But what we have seen with both courses is that those are being referenced in HEA um, fellowship applications, you know, those, those are good, providing good evidence and good context setting for staff as they're working through those fellowship applications. Um, so that they're having a real positive impact from that point of view. 
um, both courses, accessible educator as well as inclusive educator are still self enroll are still optional there's no mandatory element to them so we we have to keep on doing that kind of awareness raising that knowledge raising those conversations with departments where perhaps departments are thinking about asking their staff to engage in those courses so those kind of pushes intense period of activity perhaps and then perhaps activity drops off for a bit um, but we are seeing the badges on people's email signatures and those kind of things, which is always it's always nice when you see those coming back to you. Um, so some examples then from the resources. Um, this is the home page of the Inclusive Educator. It's just on Canvas, as we said, it's just on our VLE. Um, it's deliberately simple and straightforward in terms of navigation. Um, as we say, it's, it's self enroll So there's a join button on the home page. People can just access it anyway, otherwise, and kind of browse through. But to properly engage with it, you've, you've, got, to, you've got to join the course. Um, and it's, it's divided into a number of areas in terms of what Canvas calls modules and then discussions and a, a few other bits and pieces. Um, so this is the structure of our courses. So you have um, a, an introduction, a brief page or so of introduction that sets the context and the rationale for the course and the reason for asking people to engage with it. Uh, we have a set of qualities in both courses that these are the qualities that an inclusive educator or an accessible educator would subscribe to um, in order to apply those qualities in their teaching. Um, we have a number of links out to other resources, you know, that those are the kind of the optional on top of the optional course, if you like, those are the things that make it take longer than 30 minutes, but we have various kind of quick starts in terms of quick starts, uh, quick points that you can take on, but more detailed information that you can get engage in. And then the kind of the, the, the meat of the course, if you like, um, are then two self assessment quizzes. Um, and they're just reflective activities that colleagues work through in their own time, in their own pace, um, with no, no right answer to them, um, but just to allow you to reflect on both your attitudes and your actions in the area of discussion for the course. Um, both courses, the, the, the attitudes quizzes are, are really short. There's seven questions in those. Um, and then there's, there's 14 or 16 questions in the, in the actions um, questions in the actions um, quiz elements as well um, and we're going to take you through some of those from both of the courses in a moment so you'll get a chance to sample those um, we uh, then finish with a discussion element so the examples of inclusive practice that's a, a reflective discussion element that's an opportunity for colleagues to share with each other approaches that they're already taking perhaps to comment on approaches that other people are taking so a bit of a sharing of practice um, and we get you know really extensive good um, posts in there but also responses to posts as well so there's a good conversation happening within that that area and people picking up tips and approaches from each other as well as they work through none of this is marked or assessed um, we do go in and and you know kind of review what the, the the discussions are like what kind of approach people are taking we will sometimes pop in and, and respond and add some encouraging words usually is is, is my approach or I guess you do similar, um, but that's essentially it, essentially it's self-paced and it's standalone. Um, the final part that's not on that slide is that there's a commitment statement. So there's a very simple, um, I commit to being an inclusive educator. I commit to being an accessible educator. Yes or no. People hit yes by the time they've got that far through um, and that gets you the badge. So, you know, you kind of make that commitment to yourself um, and, and progress through. Um, so I'm going to take, through, take you through self-assessment quizzes. Um, we're going to do this on BVOX, if I can get that all working on here, which hopefully I can. Um, so let me just get that up for you. Um, so this is the first question, but obviously you've got to get into VVOX first. So um, I will just read that out because having watched some of the live stream yesterday, it's sometimes quite hard to see it from anybody who's watching the live stream. Um, so you need to go to the... Uh, to vvox.app and the ID is 185-985-361. That's 185-985-361. I just obviously give you time to get in there. And as I say, there's no, this deliberately set up so there's not, 
there's not a, a, a right answer in terms of the quiz. It's about you being honest with yourself in terms of your approach um, and your, your attitude. So we'll start off with some of the attitudes questions, first of all. So it's not, it's not a test. Um, What's the pass mark? <laughs> <laughs> no pass mark. It's the engagement. It's just that commitment at the end that's the pass mark. There's just a couple more of you to respond. I'll just give you a moment to do that. I will just pop up the results because it's always interesting to see. Um, and so brilliant, you've entered into the spirit of it, which is great um, in terms of just being honest in, in your responses there. Um, and then we do provide some feedback. Um, so I need to just swap, I'm gonna have to jump a little bit around between um, the two things. Um, so we, I'll let you read the feedback. I'm not going to read that out to you. Okay, is so everyone reasonably ready for me to move on? Um, so we'll move on to a second. Oh, how do I do that? It's a trick, Dory, isn't it? Hello, welcome. Um, we're sampling some activities from courses that we offer, um, or, or kind of self-reflection activities, if you like. So, so we're allowing people to have time to just reflect on those, um, think about their answers. Okay, so I'm going to flick, flick back to the, the feedback for that one. Just bear with me while I get down on the right slide. So moving forward then. So this is one from our Accessible Educator course.
Yeah. Thanks, Okay, and the feedback to that one, just bear with me. Mm. How's that? Okay, so those are, those are the examples of the um, the attitudes questions, and then we move on to the actions one once. So again, a few examples from both courses. Okay, and these first few don't have any feedback or comments associated with them, so they're just, just purely for you, for yourself.
and then I'm just going to skip forward to well, that's difficult to do. The two from the accessible educator course. Okay, and this one does have some feedback associated with it. So I'll just find that one for you. Um, I just wanted to add something about the decision to have two different types of quizzes. And usually there's no feedback on the actions because the actions are statements that are based on good practice, based on research. So you know how I said it was evidence-based. These statements are statements of good practice. It sort of acknowledges that you might have good reason for not putting it into practice, but it's actually saying these are actions you should be considering. Um, whereas the other thing was more about reflecting and raising awareness of how inclusive am I already? What could I be doing? The actions are like, oh, here are some things that we think you should be doing. Do you do that? You could still then decide not to, but it's sort of that mm -hmm. distinction has been made. Uh, and so that's why the first one has feedback to sort of say, this is what we think might be going on. Whereas with the actions, it's like, here's a statement of good practice. Do you do that? And so it makes people reflect, but in different ways. Great, brilliant. Right, I had to come out of those those polls now. Thank you for your your contributions and engagement in those. Um, skip forward slightly. Okay, so that was obviously quite a, a kind of a, a solo reflective activity. Um, you, you're doing that work on your own. Um, so here's the bit where you get to talk to each other now. Um, you can just do that with the person next to you, or you can do that as a, a larger table group, however that kind of works for you. But really focus on those first two questions we've got on there. So what did you think about these types of questions? Um, what do you think about the way that it makes you think in terms of engaging with that resource? Um, what about the, the types of questions and the type of contents of those questions as they were being asked and the type of feedback that you got from them as well? What were your thoughts as you were engaging in those? Um, and if you had any, if you feel you want to kind of go a bit further and think about any strong personal response to any of the questions um, or any other reactions, feel free to have those conversations as well. But really just focusing on those, those, those first two bullet points. Um, and if there is anybody watching online, feel free to put that into the um, the Q and A section on Vivox, and we'll come we'll come back and, and pick those up. I'm not going to ask every table to feedback. Not not particularly going to get feedback, other than perhaps if if some people have things that they really strongly want to share with the group after after your discussions, we'll very happily take that and, and share that with the room. Okay, let's do that for ten ten minutes. I ten think. minutes, yeah. Oh, 
Just going to give you another couple of minutes. I don't know. 
Okay. Okay, if I can just draw you draw you back from those discussions. Okay, so so what we're not going to do is get you to feedback and on precisely your answers to the questions because actually the discussion is the important bit and in a way that kind of mirrors the approach we take in the course you know it's a, the the discussions we have in the the course of the discussion forums are you know it really is just post or share something or a reflection or, or the, any of those kind of things and in a way that was what we were asking you to do here although we're asking you to reflect on the the questions and the approach there a little bit more perhaps to your own responses but but probably that thinking came into it as well so really really very much focus around that that reflective approach and that reflective thinking Having said that, is there anybody that that wants to share something or, or a thought that they were having or a response to those um, the question types we asked you or, or the questions we've got up on the screen? Is there anybody who wants to share any of those things with the rest of the room? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. You look at these areas of yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a great idea. Just summarise that in the mic. Uh, yeah, sorry. So, just in in terms of the the the, the question in for anybody uh, tuning in uh, on live stream was whether we thought about it, they, providing an action plan essentially so you know if you answer particular answers you then got a kind of a, a feedback of information that you could can take away in action hopefully that summarizes your your question yeah yeah um i i think i have a feeling we did talk about that at some point i think we were limited by the tool we had available to us at that point um, so it would be nicer to do that in a more sophisticated way that you could provide it. What we're trying to do with the feedback there is to provide some of that, that kind of prompting and some of the feedback then signposts out to other, other resources. So, so there's a little bit of that, but I think that could go further. Yeah. Um, hi, um, I have a question. Um, so in terms of um, like just the framework of the, the task, in terms of like um, stating questions to educators, um, I worry that it may be a bit too passive per se, and it doesn't force that introspection uh, among uh, edu like educators. Um, um, we were talking as a as a table of um, the scenarios and the questions that you, that you post to educators. What what if it could be in terms of um, um, like a, a video, so like creating a video of what the questions would be uh, would be like. Um, the only problem is so like when you sort of like take tasks like this and um you just put like text on it it could maybe seem a bit um 
like um it doesn't allow you to like properly engage with it and um i don't know maybe if you will see like sort of like video responses where um like students had uh so like all like educators they were like it was a example of like um i think it was like the the good students versus like um the bad students whether that would actually was portrayed as like a video and then the question actually followed up followed the response and then um um I was just like thinking, um, the only problem with the questions I feel like does it actually truly like provide that introspection among the educators just because it's in the question of format. I feel like um creating that video allows sort of like the the educators to sort of see am I actually guilty of these certain scenarios um being on screen rather than like just sort of the question, I see. I'd like to ask that to the room actually. How did people feel when they were when going through the questions? I think it's a great question, yeah, because you could provide those examples, those kind of almost role play examples, those those case studies. Yes. Oh. Deeply aware of the online folks. Um, so I'm at the University of Minnesota and I was going to ask, did you use case studies? And that gets to your point in some ways too. And we did this, a 30 minute module required. Um, and I was on the task force and we went to the consultation groups, students, faculty, administrators across five universities in the state. They all said, we want to hear from students and we want case studies that play this out. And we want to hear how the teachers responded in those cases and how the disability folks responded. And I think that was a big piece of why we got 3000 responses in a place that doesn't do that. Minnesota, the University of Minnesota is not known for compliance with um, mandatory programs, but those cases and your questions with those cases, it made me think that we need more of those questions at the end. So thank you for that. But the cases were great for the kinds of things that you're getting at and that they were student voices and they were diverse in their disabilities, their backgrounds, their experiences too. Um, I'll, I'll come back to something on that first. I actually would agree and I know videos are particularly popular. Case studies are very powerful. So if I were to develop this, I would definitely do that because I think there is something static about this, even though it's reflective, but there's two things there. One is because it's voluntary sign up and not mandatory. People don't, they, they come to learn or they come to share or both. So we've sort of already got that audience in the first place. So it's very unlikely that they'll look at the first question and the second question and go, oh, this is a bit boring. It's more likely they'll go through it. And uh, I think it comes to life on the discussions afterwards when people share their practice and respond to what they've read. That's when it comes more to life. If I was developing it, I would 100% want case studies, and I certainly would want to liven it up with different formats in there as well. In the 30 minutes, I don't think it's achievable. And so you have to compromise somewhere. And somebody over there was saying how vital the 30 minutes were. And I think it depends on your context. For us, the 30 minutes is the one principle we're not going to go away from. So that's it's a compromise somewhere. And that's the one where I think I still feel like that's where we are. But I will give that some further thought because I think it's not impossible. I think there may be some things we could do with that, but not to the extent that you have. And I think that would be a really valuable thing to do. But I think it becomes a different thing. And I'd certainly want to work on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Different formats. Comic strip, as you just mentioned, would also be very effective. They are, and I think they would uh, work very well. Um, but yeah. It's it's that's a future development one thing, if, if anything. Hi, thank you for, for sharing this. Um, our table had had a couple of questions um, that sort of linked together. Firstly, are these uh, quizzes anonymous? Um, and if not, are you sort of gathering the data on the responses and seeing sort of what your staff are, are doing as a as a collective? Uh, the quizzes are anonymous. And we're not collecting the data because we're not giving enough context here. You know, that question that says, I have my reasons. They may be very good reasons. And so there's a huge conversation to be had there. So what we do is we have the conversation at the end where people can bring those things in. And occasionally somebody says that particular question, there's something wrong with the language or there's something wrong this bit. I felt it was a little bit patronizing or something like that. So we have an open dialogue there about improving things. But we're not doing the stats. And in fact, we're very, sometimes people say, can you tell us how many people from the medical school have done this? Can you tell us how? That's the only thing we can actually say widely. But they go, what about my department? And we go, we cannot tell you that. We ask them at the beginning to identify their school. 
but we don't go deeper than that. There's, and it's very clear to the participants that this is not, not about that. I think the statistics would be interesting, but actually only if we could follow them up and, and get context. And so again, that would be a different piece of work. I think it might be different as well if it was mandatory, because I think then the institution would probably be, be asking us for that data in terms of you know, benchmarking at a point in time and then measuring change over that time in terms of those changes to those answers. Um, but, but as we say, the, the, the course is, is optional, self sign up. So yeah, thankfully we're not looking at that data and we're not sharing that. Just following up from that question, are the, um, is the discussion anonymous as, as well? And do you scaffold that in any way or is it just, here's a discussion area, contribute an example or reflect on, on the questions? How scaffolded and supported is the discussion? Yeah, I'll just on, answer that briefly and then Els will come in. So the, the discussion is not anonymous. That is, that is named in terms of those responses, but it's scaffolded in terms of share an element of your practice or comment on a post that somebody else has made. So you're not kind of required to share your expertise, particularly if you're thinking about digital accessibility, for example. It isn't, well, share something brilliant you've done from an accessibility perspective. So actually we see a lot of people saying, well, I, you know, I, I, I'm gonna really take that point away and think about that and, and maybe apply that to my practice. So it's much more reflective in that sense and responding to what else is there, but it's not, it's not anonymous, no. No, and I think that's where we we have we do have rich data because one of the things is we we noticed a lot of the discussions were about accessibility, so we felt there was a need to actually set up a resource to support people with that. So that was one example. But you know how many discussions you set up for people in your work, and sometimes people just post something and then they go away again. It's different here. It's the the I think one of the best things that I find about these resources is that we genuinely have a. a conversation across the campus which I cannot imagine otherwise because you know people do work in huge schools and they're in their own silos talking to the same people about the same things but this actually goes across and it's fascinating to see how many people actually read it and sometimes people from the school of education who are very very much clued up on some of these issues will post really long things and other people are finding it helpful and people there's a discussion there's a, a place where people can connect to others and say I can come and talk to you about x if you want just you know here's my details so that's where there's a rich data on what people actually choose to talk about, what things they find interesting, what interaction we're getting, and who wants to do what, and the cooperation that you get. So there's something definitely very rich uh, there, which I expected, but I didn't expect it to be that that amazing. It was one of those, uh, we, we need to have that at the end. Yes, but actually that's where I think a lot of, uh, you know, people go beyond the 30 minutes there, I think, and, and put that time in. And it's it's fast, it's it's mm. fabulous to read what, what good practice people are sharing across the whole campus. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I suggest we move on to yeah. some more questions for you. But again, just pick up that conversation where, where you were, because I think some of this and some of you might already have been there. And again, it's just another opportunity for you to talk to each other and maybe raise some more questions at the end. And people online, I don't know if anybody has used the platform, but they can also put their questions on. So this is really about where you go next with this. And I think some of you already do what we do or other things or in different ways. So I would encourage you to keep sharing that. Uh, and also if, if equality, diversity and inclusion is not actually part of your official role, you know, and you're here, what, what is it? Are you trying to develop that? Are you wanting to develop that? Is that something we should all be doing within what, what we do? Um, and so reflect on the ways you contribute to the development of resources on inclusivity. Um, and we, we use Canvas because that is our platform. Um, does your VLE actually lend itself to work like this or do you need something else? And in terms of the design principles that we saw here, I think we've already been touching on that. Like some of the things we do is limited. Uh, I'd, I'd still argue it's because of the 30 minutes, but maybe we should be doing and thinking about doing other things as well. Um, so where do you need other solutions? And I think that question about should, you know, is it voluntary, is it mandatory? Who delivers it? Where do they go? Should it be face-to-face? -face? Well, all those sorts of things. Be interesting if you could pick up that conversation in your groups for the next 10 minutes or so, and then we'll just come back to see if there's any more questions, any more comments. Uh, and, you know, I'll just let you get back to taking that discussion a little bit further about the future. What's, what's, what's next for you? What is in the pipeline? We've actually got five minutes till the end of the session. So it's five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> Unless you want to stay and chat after the official end. Yeah, we're here. More. 
Yeah. I've said this absolutely. I'm because our flat toys don't allow us to make that. You know, that really It's sort of I I said it exists, but it doesn't matter if it's five weeks where you do it for the forget So, like, it's possible because how much does let you go out there? And one of the content is we did have to come to the but it's not actually the functionality of the So, it's a bit in seeing how we would be able to do it. Yeah, why don't we? Um, yeah, 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 ye
I have to say that that's a bit challenging in our environment, which is collaborate with different types of spenders from the and that one in the zone right there. And I've still been having discussions because I'm getting to the people that care in the right way. But I was that is that is the to do it. We need to let people know this time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we're out of time, unfortunately. So if you if you want to go to lunch, lunch should be ready and you, you feel free to leave with 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 no, you know, no disrespect from us whatsoever. Feel free to leave. If, however, you want to carry on talking or you want to talk to us, please do stay. I believe it totally in your hands. But other than to say thank you very much for your engagement. Um, it's been really, really interesting conversation, really in both in terms of big group and also little conversations going on on the tables as well. It's really, really interesting for us and useful for us to share this and get your feedback and gives us further thoughts about how we might develop further and, and different elements that might come in or other approaches that we might want to take. We're also thinking about putting together or, or are putting together in one of our areas of uh, one of our faculties, a, a kind of a face to face version of this. Um, of the course and actually thinking about how to do accessible educator as a face-to-face -face version is is you know qu quite a challenge in many respects and so this is going to really help towards that not that you were in any way a guinea pig set for that that wasn't the aim but actually this is just a kind of a, a convenient connection of events that that this might feed into that yeah thank you very much for all your thoughts and input and we'll be here to answer any more questions or continue the conversation <laughs>